Hi everyone, my name is Amanda and I'm the CEO of The Next Economy. We're really looking forward to meeting you all in a couple of weeks time in Gladstone for the Central Queensland Energy Futures Summit. To help you prepare for the summit, we've prepared this video to explore some of the options for what coordination of the energy transition could look like for Central Queensland. We've interviewed three people from other parts of Australia who've been grappling with this question and working on different models to try and get planning and coordination to work better in their own regions. First up, we have Warwick Jordan from the Hunter Jobs Alliance, which is a community union environment group led initiative to support community to talk about what they want in terms of uh, the energy transition. Second, we have Joe James, who's the CEO of the Hunter Joint Organization, which is a group of 10 councils across the Hunter Valley. They have a broader mandate but they've also been trying to take on the challenge of coordinating the regional transition. And lastly, we've interviewed Karen Kane, the CEO of the Latrobe Valley Authority, which is a much more structured statutory authority that's been managing changes to the energy sector across the Latrobe Valley. So have a look at the videos and hopefully they'll give you some insight into how other people have been managing it. And then we can have a chat about what better coordination would look like for central Queensland when we meet in Gladstone. I look forward to seeing you all there. So the Hunter Jobs Alliance is an organisation comprised of 13 affiliates. So we have uh, nine unions and four uh, community environment groups, so all locally based in the Hunter region, quite diverse. How it came about was a recognition between worker and community environment interests that uh, there was a lot more that united them than divided them. And that was in part a recognition that, like a lot of other places in Australia where there are challenging issues around resources and, and energy, the conversation had gone a little bit sideways and trying to identify where that common ground was, where the shared interests were, and in particular, the shared interests around the future of the region. Um, how do we maintain ongoing jobs, economic opportunity, prosperity, and have a place that we all like living in? Um, and so that became really the imperative. And as uh, some of the worker organisations and the community environment organisations uh, started engaging with, with each other and talking. They found a really high level of, of common ground on some of those aspirations and particularly on wanting to have uh, a better and more constructive conversation than we've had. And yeah, so look, I would say from the outset, the model for, for us as a essentially an advocacy organisation um, seeking to represent worker and community views that haven't been as prominent as in the conversation as we would have hoped, um, is that we're there to, to advocate on this. But I think the lessons that we've learnt from um, both our past history in, in the Hunter region, we've had equivalents of um, things like the LVA in the 80s, dealing with large restructures of BHP. We had a Hunter Development Board, for example. Um, we've got some of that institutional knowledge there. Um, got models like BHP Pathways programs. We've also looked at uh, WA, Victoria and so on. And in our view, it needs to be heavily led by local people and have a lot of local input. Um, it needs to have the capacity to demonstrate that someone is in charge of what's a real issue. It's not just about nice to have diversification. It's not just about um, supporting workers who may be impacted by a specific retrenchment. It's about saying this region is taking these issues of structural economic change seriously enough that we are bringing a group of stakeholders together, bringing a group of local leaders together who are going to have uh, permission and authority and a mandate to be able to do that, um, whatever that looks like. The other couple of aspects we think are crucial, these things don't happen without substantial amounts of public investment. Um, that also helps attract that private sector investment as well. Um, we know that responding to structural change is a hard thing to do and, and that costs money. Um, and I think the other side of it is you need to create whatever the mechanism is 
it needs to be durable over time. It needs to be better than political cycles. And I know there is different ways to, mm. to do that. These are difficult issues. They're contentious issues. The Hunter region is not a small place. You know, we have more people and a bigger economy than Tasmania. And so um, there's going to be a lot of different views in there and trying to um, firstly encourage a conversation about the reality of, of structural change. Not everyone, not everyone's going to be bought into that. Not everyone is even going to believe that it's happening. Not everyone is going to believe that um, it's a problem. Uh, not everyone is going to believe that there's anything we can do about it. Not ev everyone is going to trust that government or, or a business um, will be able to do with it, deal with it or do the right thing. And so you have this big spread of opinions and um, trying to talk about what are inherently complex issues is, doesn't always cut through. And so there's inherent challenges about, our view is that, Step one is having a better quality of conversation about these issues that uh, is not people uh, yelling at each other in a polarised way. We see that as a, a distraction from whatever people view the main issue is. For us, it's about um, responding to structural change in the interests of the region um, and also looking at some of those sustainability issues. But so our, our challenge is trying to um, is, is trying to trust in the better nature and the capable nature and the fact that people in our region are fundamentally decent who um, are all interested in the future of the region. And that's the story that we need to encourage, but that doesn't always work and doesn't always cut through politics. So you've got to stick at it over time. And for an organisation that's fairly new, um, that's a journey that we're, we're on. You know, we're, we're, a, we're a means to an end. We're not the end. And so that's probably the other shortcoming when you're looking at at models, but in terms of us being an absolutely essential, necessary step to encouraging that conversation and showing what the pathway is and showing how it's practical and tangible and real, um, absolutely, we feel like what we're doing is, is really quite critical. Yeah, happy to, and uh, thanks for the uh, the invite to um, to talk, Amanda. Um, look, the uh, joint organisation is a collaboration of ten councils. Councils have collaborated in the Hunter since 1955 in some guise or another, and joint organisations is just the next evolution of of uh, that local government collaboration. Um, joint organisations, the, the, how they've evolved is they've got a statutory mandate now. So they're statutory entities and they have three um, key statutory functions. So uh, determine uh, regional strategic priorities, um, advocate for those uh, priorities and build intergovernmental collaborations around those priorities. And then in that, in that context, one of the key priorities that the member councils have uh, said is a, is a collaborative opportunity um, is the um, it's the the economic the need for economic diversification in the uh, face of changing global energy technology markets, right? Um, and which has a key impact on on the demand for a key output of ours, which is coal. Um, and we're proposing a very specific um, hunter specific solution to that, and we've coined it the Hunter Twenty Fifty Foundation. Mm -hmm. And the three uh, that's a partnership between the region and state and federal government, and its three key functions are to um, develop expertise in operating investment capability or funds around SMEs, industrial land redevelopment, um, and new energy projects. Mm. Um, that's one. That's one of the functions. A uh, second function is to provide support programs to business and workforce uh, in the context of transition at a regional scale. Um, and then the third one is to undertake place-based research and uh, and and partnerships with other um, relevant entities and institutions uh, within the region. Model. So I think the three things that we said, um, uh, important design principles, government must be involved um, mm -hmm. because government at all levels pulls policy and funding levers that affect your opportunity as a region to participate in different markets, right? Okay. Um, so government must be involved. Um, uh, you must take a place-based approach. Um, uh, and that just comes back to that. In, in, your, in any business, in any enterprise, you need to understand your comparative and competitive advantages. Um, uh, when you to, part, to successfully participate in those markets, 
And it must be enduring and flexible because this is not the work of a month or a year, but probably decades. Um, so yeah, they're, they're the design principles. So our particular model around the foundation was is a Corporations Act uh, uh, entity. Mm -hmm. um, controlled so a, com a company. A company, yeah, yeah. Yep. Controlled by the region um, um, with a skills-based board. Right? Um, controlled by the region. Who in the region? Great, great question. So the, one of the key advantages of our structure is um, is it enables local leadership. So um, uh, we see that um, a, a regional coalition, um, probably uh, with local government and industry and key institutions being the sort of the members, um, mm -hmm. it's hard to make community itself in its truest sense a member. Um, and probably one area for further development in our own model is looking at how you make sure that community voice is enduring and, and some touch points. Um, And it's not to say that the local government wouldn't um, do other things in the economic diversification space, but it is to say um, there is a, uh, in the context of the problem we have, there is a need for a very specific solution and it needs to be place-based and it needs to be supported. Um, it needs to be in partnership with state or federal government and you need a vehicle and it, the local leadership needs to have industry and community input into, mm -hmm. into that. And the JO itself is not a vehicle for for that it's mm. it's it's controlled by 10 member councils mm. so it's, it's it's recognizing that the collaborative vehicle we have is not collaborative enough yeah Maybe that's the way of putting it you know um yep. so we're a, a state administrative authority um that was established in 2000 early 2017 so we're a, we're a public service. Um, we are a government agency uh, made up of um, a team of both experienced public servants, but also um, a majority of our staff are local people who, who we've employed. And that's really important. So um, a team of people who, uh, who live here who are committed here, including myself. So except for a couple of um, Melbourne based people, the majority of us live here, this is our community. And that makes a big difference to the work that we do and how we do that work. So as an authority, uh, one of the, the really important aspects of our, our development was the ability to be uh, responsive and make local decisions um, in a way that perhaps other, other government agencies haven't been able to do. So getting the authority from state government to do that uh, was really important and um, having funds and the ability to make those local decisions based on what's needed at the time, um, driven by local people, yes, working for a government agency, but basically we were, we were a group that, that looked at the, the very complex um, and comprehensive idea of what it means for community transition with an industry transition um, right on the doorstep. So it is, it is about support for workers, um, support for business, support for community, and all of that entails. Is, is the ability to um, do some quick work, and I think that's important here. So what do you do in the first 12 months, two years, five years? on closure of any, any industry that's transitioning that has a big impact in a community. So preparing for that. Um, and how do, you, how do you do some immediate recovery work post that? If you've got time, you can do that really well. But I think the biggest story is uh, what, what, does, well, how does the, what does the community see for its future? Um, and how does it view that? And what do you draw on? What expertise and knowledge do you draw on? Um, what leadership? Um, what collaboration needs to take place. And again, I'll come back to the point, what do we learn about, what have we learnt about or can learn about places that are doing well despite those challenges? Mm. And how do you make sure that those conditions are put in place? Yeah, it depends on where uh, an, an organisation like us sits within, within uh, the public service. And so one of the things that we have learnt is that uh, we do really need the authority to be uh, locally driven, um, be, to be able to make local decisions um, and not be too constrained by the, you know, the bureaucracy of, of what can be in the public service. And so we, are, we understand that really well um, mm. because we've shifted in the public service and that's played out a bit. So I think uh, if it is going to be a government agency, um, 
uh, I think then, then those conditions need to be set from the start if you want it to be successful.